Hello, my name's Rick Boddy. I'm a professor of emergency medicine from Manchester. And today I'm going to talk about cardiac troponin. So there are two things that I'm essentially going to cover. First of all, I'm going to talk about how we can use cardiac troponin to diagnose or rule in acute myocardial infarction. And then I'm going to talk about how we can use cardiac troponin to rule out an acute myocardial infarction quickly. So cardiac troponin is a fantastic biomarker, as I'm sure you well know. The third universal, universal definition of myocardial infarction acknowledges how important this biomarker is for diagnosing acute myocardial infarction. So this slide summarizes the third universal definition of acute myocardial infarction. And you can see that the one essential criterion that you have to hit in order to fulfill that diagnosis uh, is to have a rise or fall of cardiac troponin. And there are a couple of important things about that. So you have to have a rise or fall. This is, this is important because it shows us that one single troponin level isn't enough to diagnose an acute myocardial infarction. You need to see a changing pattern. It could be a rise, it could be a fall, but it needs to change on serial sampling. So first important point, we need serial sampling. But you also need one level above the 99th percentile upper reference limit. So this is important. It tells us what the cutoff is for diagnosing an acute MI. It's the 99th percentile of the levels that we might get when we measure apparently healthy individuals. So 99% of healthy people have a level below that threshold. That's our cutoff. All you need is one con concentration of troponin above that 99th percentile and a rise or fall and then you meet the troponin criteria for the diagnosis of an acute myocardial infarction. But there's another really important thing about this universal definition, and that's that the troponin rise or fall isn't enough to diagnose acute myocardial infarction by itself. You also need one of three other things. So you need either symptoms that are compatible with myocardial ischemia. Symptoms don't need to be typical, they just need to be compatible. Or you need ECG changes, so that could be ST segment deviation, T wave inversion or new Q waves. Or you need some Im imaging evidence of an acute myocardial infarction. So you'll see loss of viable myocardium that's new on an echo, for example. There might be a wall motion abnormality that wasn't there before. Or I I've included it in three. On angiography, you might detect an intracoronary thrombus. Now you need one of those additional things, only one of them, no more than one. You can have more than one, but you have to fulfill one of them and a troponin rise or fall. And then you fulfill the criteria for the diagnosis of an acute myocardial infarction. So that makes things pretty easy. We've got this universal definition. But of course, there's lots of worry about troponin rise and rises that aren't caused by an acute myocardial infarction because troponin can rise for a whole load of other reasons. And when we're talking about ruling in acute myocardial infarction, a lot of people get worried about the false positives. And we hear terms like troponinitis or troponinemia. Now, really importantly, those terms are frowned upon in the field because they kind of suggest that a troponin rise is trivial in some cases, and it's not. Troponin is a structural protein of the heart. So if you find a high level of troponin in the blood, it's there for a reason. It's never really good. Very rarely is the troponin there when there's not a heart problem. It's usually quite specific for myocardial injury. But it, there are other, re, other reasons why the troponin might be elevated apart from myocardial infarction. So troponinitis, I think, shouldn't be thought of as a problem of a troponin test. It's our problem as clinicians. It's the condition that affects us when we misdiagnose acute coronary syndromes based only on the fact that a patient has a troponin elevation. And the cure for troponinitis, therefore, is to educate ourselves about how best to interpret troponin levels so so that we don't wrongly diagnose acute MI when patients actually don't have it. So high sensitivity troponins have really revolutionized the way that we care for patients with suspected ACS in the emergency department. They've allowed us to rule out ACS a whole lot earlier and we'll come to that later in this lecture. So as you can see, in 2009, when these assays first 
came around and they were launched in the UK in 2011. We had massive parties, of course, as you'd expect. So this is the party at my house. Everybody was very, very happy about the extra potential that we could unleash from these fantastic assays that can detect smaller concentrations of troponin with greater precision. But not everybody was very happy about this situation. This is a picture of one of our cardiologists and uh, they were worried about all of these false positives that we're going to get. So now that we can detect smaller concentrations of troponin and the cutoff is in effect a little lower than it would have been with previous generations of troponin, especially troponin T, you get more patients who have positive results and they don't have an acute MI. So how do we deal with them and how do we allay the fears of the cardiologists who think that we're going to refer everybody to them for angiography and we're going to give lots of unnecessary medication? Well, first of all, first thing to ask is, is this really a problem? Do high sensitivity troponin assays really cause more positive results in patients who don't have acute MI? And the answer is yes, but it does depend a little bit on which test you use. Now, if you have a high sensitivity troponin eye test, this, these assays aren't so affected by false positives. But with high sensitivity troponin T, which many of us use, it's manufactured by Roche, we do see an increase in the number of false positives. So in fact, let's say we had a patient with suspected cardiac chest pain. We measure their troponin and it's positive on arrival. So it's above 14 nanograms per litre, which is the 99th percentile upper reference limit. The chance that that patient actually has an acute myocardial infarction is just 50%, one in two. You may as well flip a coin to decide if that patient has an acute MI. So we do get a lot of positive results in patients who don't have an acute MI. Does that mean we need to worry about how good these tests are? Well, no because it's about how we interpret the test. We shouldn't leap to the diagnosis of acute MI just because the troponin result is positive. And I think it's quite easy to do. I think, in fact, we only need to remember three simple things, and I'm going to take you through each of these in turn. And that'll help us to differentiate those patients with a positive troponin caused by acute MI from those who have a positive troponin for other reasons. And those three things are to interpret the clinical context, so what's happening to the patient, what have they actually come in with. Interpret the patient's baseline, so we can consider what might be a normal troponin for that patient when they're healthy, based on what we'd expect from the literature. And then third, we'll look for the rise or fall of troponin. Of course, we need that to diagnose an acute MI, and I'll talk about how we determine whether that's actually present. So let's take the first thing, clinical context. So important, probably the most important thing. Now, if you expected the lab to give you a report looking like this, that says the heart attack test is positive and your patient has an acute myocardial infarction, then I'm afraid you are living in fairyland. No lab test can ever do that. The lab test only tells you the troponin result. The diagnosis is made by us as clinicians. So there's a gap there, an important gap between the test results and the diagnosis. And this is really important because with cardiac troponin, there are many, many different reasons why patients could have an elevated result other than an acute myocardial infarction. And the lab test can't tell the difference between them. Only a clinician can tell the difference between these many conditions. Now, myocardial infarction is one of those many conditions and it's our job to differentiate it. But even when we get down to diagnosing acute MI, it's really important to be able to differentiate between these two types of myocardial infarction. Now there are actually five different types of MI, but only two are really relevant to us in the emergency department. That's type one, a primary myocardial infarction, and type two, which we might think of as a secondary myocardial infarction. So type 1 MI is caused by coronary artery disease. A plaque ruptures, we get a thrombus, and some of the myocardium gets injured as a result. And that's why we see a troponin rise. Those patients are likely to benefit from antiplatelets, from PCI, and from the traditional treatments. A type 2 MI is caused by another underlying condition. So it might be that the patient has sepsis, or a GI bleed, or an arrhythmia but it's the strain that that condition puts on the patient's system that causes the myocardium to get injured. 
And that's why we see the troponin rise. So the cause is different. And they, it's important to recognize the difference here because our approach to treatment has to be different. In type two or secondary MI, our focus needs to be to sort out the underlying condition first. And only when we've done that will we really think about the coronary arteries. Now it's important that we do recognize type 2 MI because it has a very high mortality. In fact, almost double the mortality of patients with a type 1 MI. So it is important to know about, but our approach needs to be different. We'll sort out the underlying condition first. And we won't necessarily approach this by giving patients the same treatments as we would for patients with type 1 MI, antiplatelets and PCI, immediately, for example. So really importantly here, what we've established is that troponin is not a marker of myocardial infarction. It's a marker of myocardial injury. If there's a troponin rise, then it's pretty good at telling us that there's a myocardial injury present. Something has caused that myocardial injury. Only a clinician can sort that out. And a clinician uses the clinical context to tell us whether that injury has been caused by an acute MI and which type of MI that would be but it can't tell the, the lab test can't tell us that a clinician has to do it so that's why the clinical context is so important the second thing we need to remember to do is to interpret the patient's baseline so we might consider whether the troponin concentration that we see on the lab reports is what we'd usually expect for the patient's state of health now for some people we'll have the benefit of seeing previous troponin results over quite some time. Now be careful when you interpret those because sometimes you'll look back and see a troponin result that's high and it's similarly high now. It may be have been high in the past because they were having an acute MI. So just be careful to interpret the clinical context of the previous admission as well. But for some people, you can see that even when they're healthy, they have a high troponin level. Let's say the 99th percentile is 14 and we see a level of 25 and that patient always has a level around 25. That means that a level of 25 now or thereabouts is not going to be so concerning for us. We're going to wait. We're not going to overreact. Whereas if the patient's baseline was 5 and we see 25 now, we're going to think of it very differently. Now, we might not always have those previous results, so we might need to interpret the patient's baseline condition a bit more carefully. And there's some really helpful evidence to assist us with that task. So Paul Collinson from St. George's in London did a reference ranging study in London. He got patients in general practice in apparent health. He measured their troponin. And at the same time, he also sent them a questionnaire to ask them about cardiac risk factors, previous cardiac disease. They did um, an echo and they measured BNP and the renal function. Now, when they derived the 99th percentile, so 99% of people remember have levels below that concentration, in everybody, they derived the 99th percentile in everybody, regardless of whether they had risk factors, heart disease, renal dysfunction, the 99th percentile for high sensitivity troponin T was 30 nanograms per litre. Now, if you screen out the people with renal disease, high BNP, abnormal echoes, known heart disease, significant risk factors for heart disease, and then you develop, derive the 99th percentile again, you'll find that in those normals, as Paul did, the 99th percentile is exactly what the manufacturer said, 14 nanograms per litre. So what's this telling us? Well, it's telling us that in patients who have those risk factors, the renal dysfunction, the LV dysfunction, known heart disease, abnormal echoes, that the 99th percentile is at least double the usual 99th percentile. So we could expect to see levels of this magnitude in apparently healthy people who don't have an acute MI. So if those patients have those risk factors, let's not overreact in the ED necessarily. Let's wait to get a bit more information. Age is another really important factor in determining a patient's baseline troponin. Now, Hammersten and their group, I think in Sweden, de derived the 99th percentile in the emergency departments in young people who are less than 65 years old and older people who are over 65. And they found a huge difference. Now, admittedly, these patients may have other things going on. So they're not healthy people, they're in the ED. 
But in young people, the 99th percentile was 12 nanograms per litre. In older people, look at that, 82 nanograms per litre, which is huge. So in older people, this is telling us that we can expect higher troponins, even in patients who don't have an acute MI very often. They have higher levels at baseline. But while this allows us to perhaps let some of the slight troponin elevations go, at least on the first sample in the emergency department, when we know that there are risk factors, there is a reason why we should accept that low cutoff at the standard 99th percentile. We shouldn't be throwing the baby out with the bathwater by saying we just accept a higher cutoff, which some people do. Now, the, there's a, the best evidence that we have about patient outcomes from this is actually from Nick Mills in Edinburgh. And here's a study from a few years ago now in Edinburgh where they were using a troponin eye assay. And they looked at outcomes of patients with acute MI or suspected acute MI stratified by their troponin results. And you can see that the outcome of patients with a troponin of less than 0.05 nanograms per mil was relatively good in this study and much worse in patients who had a really high troponin. But in the middle, this borderline group, patients with a small troponin elevation, uh, the outcome was disproportionately bad. Now significantly, during this period in Edinburgh, they were diagnosing acute MI if your troponin was above this threshold, 0.2, but not for these patients. They weren't diagnosed with acute MI, so they didn't get treatment. Now, they changed their protocol to start diagnosing acute MI above 0.05, and those patients then received the benefit of all of the evidence-based treatments. And they looked again at what happened to the patients. And now you can see that the outcomes of those patients in this middle group is so much better. We've improved the outcome simply by recognising that these patients had acute myocardial infarction and giving them treatment. So there's a lot of important information in small troponin elevations that we need to take account of because our patients will do better for it. So don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Don't just say, well, there's loads of false positives below 50 nanograms per litre, so I'm going to ignore everything below that. That would be the wrong thing to do for your patients. So that's how we interpret the patient's baseline. So we've covered the first two things, clinical context and the patient's baseline. Next, we need to look at whether there's a rise or fall of cardiac troponin on serial sampling. Now, traditionally, we'd accept that a 20% change in the troponin concentration on serial sampling is significant. And that was really by convention. It was developed by biochemists based on how precise the assays were so that we could differentiate a real change in troponin from something that's just caused by the assay being imprecise. Because you always get a little bit of change. If you, change, if you test the same sample several times, you'll get different results. So we accepted this 20% change. And you know what? Nowadays we realise that that's a little bit flawed and we probably shouldn't be accepting the 20% change, especially with high sensitivity troponin assays. And here's the reason. If you have a relative change of 20%, well, it biases you towards diagnosing very small MIs that are more likely to be non-AMI positives and it biases you against diagnosing the big MI. So here are two fictional cases. The first has troponin results of 15 and then 10 on serial sampling. Let's say the cutoff is 14. This gives you a delta of 50%, so it meets the criteria for an acute MI. Um, but actually that five nanogram per litre change could just be the imprecision of the assay potentially. Um, and you know, maybe a false positive. Whereas this patient went from 2,000 to 2,200, that's a 200 nanogram per litre change on the serial sampling, but the delta is only 10%. So you wouldn't diagnose an acute MI in this patient, but you would in this, this one with a small troponin rise. So instead of using the relative delta, we've recognised now, based on good evidence in the literature, that the absolute change is better. And it's very easy to measure the absolute change. You just take the maximum troponin and take away the minimum troponin. And that gives you better sensitivity and specificity for an acute MI. Now, the change that you accept to diagnose acute MI it depends on the test that you're using. For high sensitivity troponin T, if the two tests are six hours apart, 
then a change of at least 9.2 nanograms per litre seems to be better. So if you don't report decimal places, that's 10 nanograms per litre or more. And if you do the tests three hours apart, seven nanograms per litre seems to be the right one. And that's based on good data. Um, now, as a general rule of thumb for other assays, a change of about half of the 99th percentile is significant. So for the Siemens troponin I assay, for example, a change of 20 nanograms per litre is significant because the 99th percentile is 40 nanograms per litre. That's a rule of thumb, but really you should look for specific evidence to do with the assay you're using. So three things to beat troponinitis, clinical context, patient's baseline and a rise or fall. If you follow those three simple things, I think that you will not go far wrong. You will be able to differentiate the acute MIs from the troponin rises that are caused by other conditions. What about rule out? Well, this is where high sensitivity troponin really helps us because we're inundated with patients presenting with chest pain. 6% of all emergency department attendances are for chest pain. Over 25% of acute medical admissions were found to be due to chest pain when Steve Goodacre looked at this quite a few years ago. And you know what? Just one in five of the patients we admit for investigation actually has ACS. In some studies, it's even lower than that. So imagine if we filled up our hospitals with people who 80% of the time didn't need to be there. Imagine how full our corridors would be in the ED. Imagine how crazy it is that we're using our expensive inpatient resources and looking after these patients when they don't actually have an acute coronary syndrome. We need to do better. We should only be admitting people if they have ACS. So we need better diagnostics in the ED to avoid over admission. There's great potential to do this in chest pain. High sensitivity troponin assays really help us with this. Now, let's just take a step back for a minute before we understand how they help us. We just need to understand what a high sensitivity troponin assay is first, and then we can understand what they can do for us. So to be labeled as a high sensitivity assay, the troponin test has to meet two criteria. First of all, it has to be able to detect sufficiently low concentrations of troponin. So this is about analytical sensitivity, not to do with the diagnosis. It's about how low the concentrations are that the troponin test can detect. And to meet these criteria, the assay has to be able to detect troponin in over half of apparently healthy individuals. So if you measure the troponin in a room of 30 people, then 15 of them should have a level that doesn't say less than something. So for troponin T, you know, it won't be less than three for over half of the people. The second thing that the assay has to do is to be very precise. So we measure, precision tells us, you know, if you test the same sample several times, how much is the result going to vary? And we can measure precision using something called the coefficient of variation. Now, at lower concentrations, the coefficient of variation tends to be higher. So, you know, it's harder to have a precise test when you're trying to detect low amounts of troponin. And the coefficient of variation has to be less than 10% when we've got a sample of blood with a concentration of troponin that's exactly the same as the 99th percentile. So that means that you'll get roughly, if you test the same sample twice, less than 10% change between the uh, results, approximately. You might think, well, how on earth does that help us in the ED? You know, being able to detect troponin in healthy people and having a precise assay, how does that really help us? Well, there's a reason why it helps us. So let's deal with the first one first, analytical sensitivity. And again, I'm going to use the example of high sensitivity troponin T, the Roche assay. So with the old assay, we call it contemporary troponin when it's not high sensitivity. The 99th percentile was here. This is 0.01 nanograms per mil. And basically, this was also the limit of detection of the assay. So you either had levels that were less than 0.01 nanograms per mil, and they were undetectable, or they were detectable and abnormal. With a high sensitivity assay, the 99th percentile is here, that's 14 nanograms per litre, different units. But we can detect troponin right the way down to well, three nanograms per litre, which is something called the limit of blank, or five, which is the limit of detection. So we've now got all of these levels here that we can detect, but that are below the cutoff for acute MI. 
Now, if you want a rule out test, a lower cutoff is going to be better for you because it will have higher sensitivity and higher negative predictive value. Let's just imagine you had an acute MI and it takes several hours for troponin levels to go above the 99th percentile. Of course, during those several hours, you'd expect the levels to be gradually rising. They will hit this threshold far earlier than they hit this threshold. So if we want early rule out, setting the cutoff down low is really going to help us in the ED. So what does the evidence say about how this actually works? Well, here's some evidence from the TRAPID AMI study, a multi-centre study in uh, 14 centres from 12 countries that I was privileged to be involved with, and we looked at how accurate this strategy was. So we found that if the troponin was less than 5 nanograms per litre on arrival using high-sensitivity troponin T, and the ECG was normal, then 37% of patients could have been discharged immediately. So just over one in three, of course. That's quite good. That's more than one in three patients who would have been admitted, now going home after a single test, potentially. And it was pretty accurate. The sensitivity for acute MI was 99.1%, and the negative predictive value was even higher. So that's with one test. And this is just one study showing this. There are loads now out there showing similar results that we could rule out with one test if we set the threshold at the limit of detection of the high sensitivity assay. With high sensitivity troponin I, we could do the same thing. Some people will say you can still set it at five. I'm not convinced that the sensitivity is the same. It's 94% in some studies. I'd go lower. Look at Ed Carlton's paper in JAMA Cardiology. It suggests that we should go down to about two nanograms per litre with the Abbott troponin I assay. So that's why analytical sensitivity helps us. We can rule out with one test because we can detect smaller concentrations and put the threshold down lower to rule out. What about precision? How can that help us? Why is it important to have a precise assay so the results change less when you test the same sample? Well, it means that we, a smaller change that we see uh, on serial sampling is more likely to be significant. So here's why it helps us. This is the one hour rule out strategy. Two tests, one hour apart. Now, if you're looking for a change on troponin sampling in an acute MI, if you leave it six hours between the samples, you'd expect that, you know, most people will have a big change. So, you know, you, you're going to be able to have a big, uh, a, a, a big threshold, a high threshold for detecting a change on serial sampling. If you're doing the tests one hour apart, a patient with an acute MI is probably not likely to have a big change in troponin. You need to detect a small change to know that it's real. With a precise assay, we can do that. So this is how the one hour protocol works. If your first troponin is less than 12, and then you do the second test one hour later, and it's changed by less than three nanograms per litre, so it could have ri risen or it uh, could have fallen. If it's changed, then you can't rule out. If there's no change, this slide should say no change, then you can rule out. Yeah, change less than three, you rule out. And 63% of patients could have an acute MI ruled out that early, two tests taken one hour apart with this strategy. And it's recommended for use by the European Society of Cardiology. Little caveat, would you accept the chance of 3.3% uh, missing an acute MI. 3.3% of patients with acute MI missed by this strategy, and that's not even looking at adverse events at 30 days. You'll have to accept that risk if you're going to use it. I wouldn't use it by itself. I'd use it with a risk score, and we'll come on to those in a minute. And here's another caveat. So I, I mentioned that this is for an acute MI. Why would I not use those strategies by themselves? Well, here's some nice evidence published in Jack from Bertie Lindahl's group. Mokhtari published this nice paper. And they looked at that one hour rule out protocol, but they looked not at the diagnosis of acute MI, but at whether patients developed major adverse cardiac events within 30 days. And that one hour rule out protocol by itself had a sensitivity of 88%. So 12% of patients with the MACE, major adverse cardiac events, were missed. That's not great. 
If you accounted for the ECG and history and used the clinical judgment of the emergency physician, you could get up to 100%. Now, we could use unstructured Gestalt and the ECG, but actually it might be better to use something more structured so that you get a consistent approach across all of your doctors. And that's where risk scores come in. So I would always advocate using a risk score personally. Not everyone would agree with me, but I think the evidence does agree with me. So there are several risk scores out there. The first one that you probably know about is the Timmy risk score. This was developed to risk stratify patients with confirmed ACS, but has been used in the ED to uh, identify low risk patients. And Martin Than and his group in Australasia found that if you have a low Timmy risk score, so it's zero, and normal troponin on arrival and two hours later, then we could get 20% of our patients home. And wow, just look at these characteristics. 99.7% sensitivity and negative predictive value. So we're pretty confident that this is a good strategy. It's helping us to rule out. It's only getting 20% of people home and it's requiring two tests two hours apart, but still it can help us. So this is something that you could use. And Martin and his group with Louise Cullen have um, derived an, the EDAX score, which is, works similarly. You use two tests two hours apart and a score that they developed uh, specifically to rule out in the ED. And that works, I think, even better uh, because you get more people home. It's for about 40% of people home after your two-hour test. So that's great. You could try and rule out with one blood test, just like the limit of detection strategy I mentioned earlier with high sensitivity troponin. You could use a heart score. The heart score is very simple. H stands for history, E for ECG, A for age, R for risk factors, and T for troponin. And you score each of those things from zero to two. There are criteria for doing that. So it's quite simple to use. It was developed by intuition not by machine learning or stats, it was developed by intuition. It just seemed like a really good idea. And admittedly it was because lots of people use it. And there's good evidence that we can use it to rule out. We did a meta-analysis recently of 12 studies, 11,000 patients. And again, you can see that it's got 96.7% sensitivity. So about 3.3% of patients with ACS essentially will be missed by the heart score on arrival. Now you might not want to accept that. In the US, they've done two troponin tests, three hours apart and discharge if the heart score is also low. I think that's probably a bit better if you want to be uh, sure that you're not missing events. Um, and uh, there's good evidence that that's a more sensitive strategy. But of course, it does mean your patients stay in for the three hour test. So the heart score is another risk score we could use. And now I'll tell you about the one that we developed in Manchester, TMAX, the troponin only Manchester ACS decision aid. So what did we aim to do with TMAX? Well, we aimed to combine the history with the ECG and the troponin measured when patients first arrive in the ED. And we'd use that to calculate the probability that each patient has ACS. And based on that probability, we'd either rule out or rule in ACS. So TMAX is not just a rule out tool. It's also going to help us to rule in ACS with one test in the emergency department. And it's going to give us that probability. So here's how it works. We, we derived this by logistic regression. So it's, it's not anyone's opinion. It's, uh, we, we, did, we did the study, we collected all of the data, and we worked out which factors are actually predictive in the ED population, just like where they did with the EDAX score. And our rule essentially has seven criteria. ECG ischemia, a pattern of worsening angina, pain that radiates to the right arm or shoulder, pain associated with vomiting, visible sweating, not just reported, visible sweating, a blood pressure less than 100 millimeters of mercury, and the troponin result. And this has been validated with the troponin T assay and also a contemporary assay, Siemens troponin I. And there's more to come on other assays too. So they're using that data. You just plug those things in. You, this the computer can work out the probability. You could use it as a checklist, just like the heart score, but I prefer it when you put it into a computer and get the probability. I think that's a nice function, and most of us have access to computers, so it's not a problem to use it that way. You'll then get a risk group, and the computer will, will tell you what to do with the patient. I mean, you could use that as a checklist, as I say, but I find it nicer when it's used with a computer. So this is how we use it in Manchester. This is a recommendation to go to the ambulatory care unit and repeat the troponin in three hours. Now below 2%, this has been validated as a rule out strategy to uh, 
to allow patients to go straight home from the ED. Um, and we get four groups, very low, ruled out immediately, low, have a second troponin in three hours, moderate, they come in, they generally get a second troponin in six hours and rule in. Well, we know the diagnosis. And in our validation study of over 1,500 patients, the sensitivity of TMAX was the same as the limit of detection strategy. And this is not just for acute MI, it's for major adverse cardiac events within 30 days. So LOD strategy, that's less, troponin less than five and a normal ECG. It's, this is advocated now for use in practice by the ESC, European Society of Cardiology, and NICE, and TMAX had equal sensitivity but TMAX allows more people to go home with one test. It's more specific. So over 40% of people could go home with TMAX. So um, that's why we prefer it and use it in Manchester. It also rules in. So about 5% of patients are immediately identified as being at high risk and over 90% of them have ACS. Now the one hour protocol can also rule in, but the positive predictive value of that is more like 70 to 80%, uh, whereas Tmax can get you above 90%. So again, another function that I like about what we use in Manchester. So that's about all I've got to talk to you about today. Um, we've gone through three things here. We've talked about how to rule in acute myocardial infarction appropriately and how to avoid troponinitis, wrongly making a diagnosis of acute MI just based on the troponin concentration. And we said there are three things you need to do. Interpret the clinical context, what's going on with the patient and does it fit with acute MI or is there another cause for the troponin rise apparent? We interpret the patient's background to know if they're expected to have a troponin level that's as high as we've seen it in the lab results. And we look for the rise or fall. An absolute change in troponin appears to be better than a percentage change or relative change. Troponin is a marker of myocardial injury, not myocardial infarction. I mean, that goes with point one, especially with clinical context, but I want to hammer that point home. A high troponin means the myocardium is injured. It's up to us as clinicians to decide if that injury was caused by an MI or something else. And the third thing we talked about was how to rule out early. So we talked about how we can use high sensitivity troponin on arrival and at one hour. The nice uh, recommendations suggest we can do this at three hours, but with, even within one hour we can rule out acute MI. But I mentioned that I think it's really important to use a risk score as well and not just rely on the troponin result. And there are lots of them around that are validated. Tmax derived especially in the ED to help us to best use the information on arrival, including that first troponin result. Heart, again, combining ECG history and troponin on arrival, and might be a bit better if you use the three hour troponin based on our systematic review and the evidence from the United States. Timmy with a zero and two hour protocol, but even better than Timmy, if you're going to use the zero and two hour troponins and you don't fancy any of these others, EDAX is a very good option. But use a risk score. I hope that was helpful and um, good luck with your masters. Take care.